thinking about how President-elect uh, Joe Biden uh, uses Irish literature. Is it consolation or does it have a public force? And the, you know, those are not necessarily um, incompatible. If you think about an ad that he just uh, released last week, it is both public force and that it's, it's an election ad but it also has a sort of a consolatory tone. And um, I'm, I'm gonna ask Claire to respond to that question again, but let me remind you um, to drop questions in the Q&A uh, feature. We have a few questions already that uh, I know Claire answered a couple, but we might actually answer them um, uh, here amongst us as well. Um, so please, please, um, we'll turn to a public question or to questions from the audience in a, in a few minutes. But Claire, do you want to talk a little bit about this sort of the sense of the public nature of writing and what I mean you know the question like one of the questions like is it uniquely Irish I think the answer to that is going to have to be no but is there something about Irish literature that that um in which this is more visible well there's no doubt about it we have some uh, great pieces of public writing in um in our in our literary canon um uh something like Paula Meehan's this, uh, the statue at Grenard speaks you know is it an enormous public intervention um, but that's been very well addressed by everyone already, but I suppose I want to hold back a little from that and say, too, that there is something about literature and what it can conceal uh, that matters, um, something about language and silence, secrecy, um, and that the power of literature is sometimes in the, you know, not in the public, but in the, in the private and the what's not said, you know, there's a, um, there's a wonderful Donegal memoir, you probably know it, Colleen, the, um, the memoir of Hugh Dorian, the Donegal schoolmaster. And he's talking about how Ireland, a changing Ireland uh, after the famine. And he's, there's a scene in it where he's talking about the reading of the American letters. You know, somebody is reading out the letters to the rest of the community. And, and uh, Dorian says, of course, he says, in every private letter, there's something that other people have no right to know. Um, and there is something of that in literature, I think. There is something in the best kind of poems that sometimes you don't have a right to know or the right to know it has to be earned or gained with time or close reading or whatever. So I think that that's also a really important aspect of this for me. Yeah, and I think also um, Paige and Eric picked this up a little bit, both in the volumes and in, and in their, in their um, blog posts about this, the sense that the study of literature and the writing about literature is a slow process. Uh, and it's a process of um, introspection on the part of the scholar um, and, or, or the writer, and that there's a tension between the sort of the immediacy of the, of the life of politics and the immediacy of, of uh, public questions and the kind of writing that both we do and uh, the objects of our study have been doing. Um, I might actually uh, transition uh, there and take, take a question from, from the audience. And for Kesha Agen Ncha O Folo Guir, uh, we, we, we about the Irish language and the place of the Irish language in these volumes and and uh, and Claire, I know you. So, so uh, Paul Aguirre asks, uh, it, you know, it, it, are the volumes just about the, uh, the English language? And Claire, you sort of pointed out here in an answer. You said, you know, we, we do have a chapter on the Irish language in each volume. Um, but but that might sort of open up a, a little bit more to thinking about the sort of the comparative aspect across languages and um, that we know in the 19th century and the 18th century was alive, a sense that the languages spoke to each other and with each other, uh, not just a sort of a hidden Ireland through the Irish language. Um, but I might actually add, turn that question to Eric and Paige, maybe Eric first, and ask, you know, what were the challenges of thinking about the Irish language and its relation to English language production uh, in the contemporary moment, and um, from 1980 to 1920, as we know that the sort of you know there's a there's an explosion of cultural production of Irish after the the foundation of of um, T. G. Cahar or Telefish Nguega uh, in the 1990s, um, but but in many ways these are two ships passing in the night in some ways in scholarship. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good I think that's a good image or, or, or metaphor to kind of use that. I mean, we we really I mean we really tried in the um, in, in the volume as best as we could to, <laughs> to, to not kind of um, gloss over, I think the reality of that fact that, you know, um, but also to, to write about both traditions, um, both on their own terms and when they, and when they intersected in, in important ways and as they intersected, and especially not to see it as simply a kind of a, um, a, a one way, a, a unidirectional Kind of set of influences, um, but to see, you know, how um, writers in Irish were thinking about writers in English and the other way round, right? And so um, issues of trans, you know, but there are chapters um, in the volume um, 
on Irish literature that also take up, on Irish language literature that obviously also take up questions about translation and mediation and publication, because I think one of the major issues um, in, you know, it was seen in poetry first, perhaps, but one of the major issues in thinking between, um, between the two languages is, you know, the, the ways in which those volumes were published and presented, right? And, you know, the dual language volume in, in Irish poetry, um, you know, has a history. Um, it, you know, it's, a lot, it's, it's, it, it's longer than, you know, going back to 1980 and New Goddell's, you know, selected poems and, and the early, early anthologies, but um, we wanted to tell that story as, as best as we could. And so, um, you know, I think we made deliberate choice, you know, but putting, about putting the, a chapter, um, but put, putting Alvey's chapter first, you know, the kind of contemporary conditions of Irish language literature to try to get a sense from the very beginning of the volume that both languages, um, the literature of both languages was very much in play, even though the kind of the ratios would shift as the volume went on. I don't know if Paige wants to, has more to add there. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, there are a kind of a general critical point as well as a more specific example. Um, the first was what really struck me, I think, in editing um, pieces for both volumes about Irish language writing in the contemporary moment is the labor that it requires of critics, right? Um, that there's the necessity both of introducing writers whom few know or fewer know than say a Yates or a Joyce, um, as well as having to sort of interrogate those, right? So there's, there's an interesting move that writers who are working in translation have to do, the writers who are working strictly in English did not, which I just found fascinating as an editor to observe. Um, and then I guess sort of both seconding um, Eric's write on remarks is to point to to an article um, to the essay by Maureen Nagoan in the New Irish Studies because I talked to Maureen about writing something about what does it mean to be global as an Irish language writer and she did an amazing job of great the work I'm describing right I mean she surveys just an astonishingly fascinating body of work but she also pulls some really interesting critical threads that were entirely new to me I mean the idea that so many of these Irish language writers in the contemporary moment have been looking at global conflict right that there's a critique embedded in Irish language writing about what's happening across the world. And it's not sort of either or, right? That you have, you have these writers coming from a quote unquote minority language, right? That's spoken and written by very few on the global landscape. But it also acknowledges the complicity of someone living in Ireland in a lot of these conflicts across the globe, right? That if you are part of a, of a larger kind of Anglophone culture, whether you're writing in that language or not, what is your place? What is your responsibility? Um, as a member of the, the Irish community on that island um, in terms of interventions across the globe. So, you know, it just, all these like incredibly surprising and exciting um, uh, findings that you have when these languages in our moment, right, rub up against each other. Yeah, yeah, there's a great sense in that chapter in which, um, in which, and we saw this in the in the um, conversation a couple of weeks ago about decolonizing Irish history. There's a great sense in that chapter in which, you know, the Irish language both speaks as a sort of an oppositional to uh, sort of a dominant language culture, but at the same time, the Irish language is an official language of the state and has been held up by the state uh, as a sort of an object of official veneration. And there's a tension between those in many ways. Marjorie, you were going to jump in and, and then and then actually I'll, I'll, I'll well, you, you jump in and then I'll, I'll ask another question after that for both Marjorie and Claire. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to add briefly that um, I think we were, we were aware of not simply trying to think about English, the English language's um, relation to Irish, but also, um, you know, the Irish language has a whole European dimension. So in volume four, there's a very fine essay by Brian O'Connor um, in which he argues that the shift from privileging classical Irish to an emphasis on dialect, you know, around the turn of the 20th century, um, happens not out of, out of a kind of nativism, but because of the influence of European linguistic thought. Um, so just to, anyway, it has this really international dimension in the earlier periods as well. Yeah, the, the question of vernaculars and its relationship to modernism in many ways, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna add two questions together here, um, one from Sheila McCavey and, and the other from um, Jose Limon. And, and they're both questions about representation. I could ask Claire and Marjorie these. Uh, the first one is uh, sort of a general, uh, Jose Limon looks, um, uh, asks you know, in particular about a particular writer, Belfast writer, Sam Keary, published two novels, one collection of stories in the 1980s doesn't turn up. And that sort of raises the question of like, how on earth 
<laughs> did you make those and did you ask your, your writers to make those distinctions between what can be written about, what, what there's room for, what there's not room for? Did, well, you know, was that a, I mean, it had to have been a difficult choice. And um, it doesn't matter that you have 130 writers, 120 writers across so many pages, but you know, there, there are choices of distinction. And in many ways, there are choices of anti-canonization that are going on here. Um, and then Sheila McCabe's questions, related question about, uh, about um, uh, uh, representation, but it's about the representation of writers of color um, across, and, and, and that, you know, in many ways, the question I think is directed towards Paige and Eric, but I'd love to hear more about that across all of the volumes, right? We can think about this from the 18th century forward, that, uh, that Irish literature was not merely a literature written by sort of those who might be identified now as Irish. Um, so those are two questions for Claire and Marjorie. Uh, just in relation to the second one first, it's really, um, Paige has really fly, is flying the flag for the project um, in relation to incorporating um, more, more diverse voices um, and the, uh, both in the New Irish Studies actually and in um, Irish literature in transition 1980 to 2020. Um, and yes, you certainly can look back and one can see um, references to the kind of role of racial thinking uh, from 1700 forwards and the way that shaped certain kinds of um, uh, thinking or around ideas of Irishness. And that's, it's, again, it's really true for Thomas Moore, actually. Uh, the um, first question to do with, um, uh, sorry, yes, Sam Keary, he sounds really interesting. Uh, at some point, Colleen, we just had to kind of trust our editors and our authors, I suppose, in a sense. So there are there are some writers who are discussed in the books who are already very well discussed, um, Edgeworth, Swift, uh, Yeats, Joyce, and, and so on. And when it comes to the treatment of those authors, the approach is more towards kind of um, new approaches or prompting different kinds of conversations about those writers, deepening existing conversations. Uh, but we did try and do justice to the recovery work that Marjorie is talking about. Um, and as I was just saying to that person in the chat there, it's a really interesting question. We just hope that there are kind of signposts in the volumes to guide that kind of work where, where there isn't coverage because there just isn't coverage of everything. Yeah, in many ways, this is, you know, these are volumes that look like that sort of are under the sign of a large archive, but in many ways are about methodologies for study um, and sort of new ways of reading archives you already have found. Um, so, you know, while, while it, the, the sort of the form of appearance, as Marx might say, is a history of Irish literature, what's inside it in many ways is a sort of an investigation of methodologies in Irish studies. And that actually leads me to Hey, yeah, Paige, go ahead. I just wanted to jump in to say, um, just to pick up on the point that Claire had mentioned, that New Irish Studies was really committed to representing diverse voices in Ireland in the 21st century. Um, so, you know, we have essays on um, representations by, by Irish writers of humanitarianism in Africa. Um, but we also have really interesting essays on intersectionality, because that was a big thing for me, right? I didn't want to sort of parse out race, class, gender at every, at every gate, but instead to think about how all of these factors are working together in 21st century Ireland. So um, Michael Pierce has a fantastic essay on kind of intersectionality, like class and race on the stage. Um, and Charlotte MacGyver did a fantastic sort of excavation of the ways in which arts institutions sort of um, both support but also fail to support writers of color and migrant writing and performance um, so that you can see the gestures that the state makes and you can also see places where both um, commercial as well as um, nonprofits both attempt and and could do better in terms of supporting um, writers of color in Ireland. yeah yeah I mean, I mean i mean i mean part of part of what both New Irish Studies and the entire um, sort of set of volumes here, all seven volumes. And by the way, actually, I should say, um, in case you missed it, uh, um, links for how to buy these with a 20% discount have been dropped into the chat. So, you know, Paige is selling this really hard and it is amazing. I've seen the PDF of it uh, and I've seen the, these are really you know, extraordinary uh, monuments of landmarks. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's an actually terrible word because um, uh, that, that makes them sound like products, but in fact, they are processes. Um, and we, we can watch these volumes move in many ways. But, but Paige, your question, or your, your answer leads me to a, a bigger question that is sort of impossible to answer. But in many ways, um, I, I wonder whether the category of Irish literature 
is something that we should be sitting here talking about right now, right? What what is it about that? And that's you know, as as Claire points out in uh, in, in a few different places, Claire points out that in many ways, like, this, this, this category Irish literature was made, not born, uh, in some ways, and has has its course run. Like, what is it to continue to talk about literature under the sign of the nation? Um, even as we sort of, you know, question the sign of the nation um, uh, at a moment in which, you know, we probably all of us, I'm going to sort of speak for all of us, in, in which we have, we have sort of you know, ambivalent feelings about the very question of nation nationality. Uh, and, the, you know, the study of literature has long found itself more so than many other disciplines, has long found itself tied to nations and nationhoods. Uh, part of that has to do with language. Um, but you know, is there a, is there a sense in which Irish literature has has run its course? I hope Ambassador Mulhall is not listening to this question. Uh, sorry, I can ask that of uh, um, Eric or um, Marjorie or uh, Eric. Why don't we start with, start with, start with you? Sure. Um, sorry, that was an out of the out of left field question. <laughs> oh no, that's sorry. Right. I was I was trying to I was entering a question in the chat, so I got a, I got a little. Ah, okay. Um, I mean, yes and no. I think it, you know, I think, is it important for us to think about Irish literature outside of the context of the nation, however we think about, you know, and that question? Absolutely. Um, is it important to, us to, consider, to continue to consider that there is a body of work by a, a large number of people over a long period of time by um, writers who are who consider themselves to be Irish in some fashion, and some of those writers are writing in Ireland, and some of them writing, are writing in Europe or England, and some of them are writing in the United States or beyond. Um, I think, you know, there is a set of, um, there continues to be a set, a really broad set of cultural production that um, makes sense to think about in terms of um, Irish Irish literature, and which isn't simply to say, to say that it's a question about Irishness or Irish, um, the Irish nation. I mean, you know, if we think all the way back, even before the volumes, you know, we have we have literature in Ireland. I mean, Irish, you know, Irish literature might be the oldest vernacular literature in Europe. And so, you know, it's it's not just a question. I mean, Irish literature isn't isn't simply, I don't think, a function of or related to the question of of an Irish nation. And so, I think yes, we need to shift how we think about Irish literature and the word Irish in that in that title, but. I think you know it's still a good way to to gather the many and diverse and remarkable materials um, from you know hundreds of years in multiple languages by lots of writers um, that kind of we can think about as being Irish literature as long as that term I think it's about how you know our our sense of bagginess and flexibility and generosity and to go back to a words pages word care with which we think about the term um, as we use it. Marjorie, yeah. I'm, I'm actually quite struck with the durability of categories like the nation and the national. I mean, for decades, a number of academic fields have been kind of predicting the demise of the nation state, right? <laughs> with, right? Um, and yet, for various reasons, um, which we probably don't want to go into right, right now, though, those categories do persist. It's not just that they were in to, um, that they were important in the past. I think they continue to matter um, today. And yes, we need to think about them um, in relation to the international, in relation to the local, and so on. I mean, for me, in a lot of ways, Irish studies is kind of the window through which we can study globalization, so that you know, study the study of Irish literature can become, in part, a study of these kind of global um, issues and literatures, but but the idea of Irish literature gives us a way of kind of focalizing it uh, in a way that I find I'm helpful, and I and I suspect I will continue to find helpful going forward. Um, although I also want to totally agree with what Eric said about being very self conscious when we do that. Yeah, like uh, Eric's terms, and, and in many ways, this is what across all of these seven volumes is that there is a care and a generosity to the definition of Irishness, um, and not just in terms of archives, not just in, certain, in terms of writers and where they've come from, but again, in terms of the questions that we ask um, and where those questions have come, on, come from and how we're listening to literary studies across the world in many ways. 
I have a, a, a final sort of a wrap up question. This really is, um, well, Paige, I might turn to you actually, because you have thought in the coda to your new Irish studies book, you've thought, I think a lot about this thing called Irish studies, which is not Irish literature, it is related to it. And it often turns up uh, as a sort of a discipline of our field of just Irish literature and history. Um, and, I, and, and in many, you know, I guess you, you, you raised the question about what the future is for Irish studies. So follow up on that question, and particularly here in the US um, and particularly in US universities that are in many ways um, very slowly shifting towards recognizing the need to turn their institutional priorities towards um, minority, uh, minority groups, towards sort of marginalized groups. And that, is not, that does not necessarily describe Irish literature as a field, nor does it describe Irish Americans. So Paige, maybe you might give us a sense of like how you've been thinking about the future, or the possibility of the future for Irish studies. Yeah, I mean, I, rather than turning to something in one of the volumes, I might even just speak to how Irish studies generally works for me in the classroom on issues like that, right? That, you know, being able to talk to students in an incredibly fraught moment of racial relations, productively fraught moment of racial relations in the United States, to kind of skew their perspective through what's going on in Ireland, I found to be enormously productive as an exercise, right? Because what's going on in Ireland is just that much more familiar, but also different from the dynamics in the States, that students are able to think about the use of the N-word in literature, right? When you're teaching Roddy Doyle in a way that's different from when they're grappling with that and say Huckleberry Finn or Native Son, right? So that you, you can sort of productively, I think, engage in classrooms with issues that speak very poignantly to contemporary American conditions, but render them unfamiliar to students in a way that gives them more creative space and more critical space and, and frankly smarter and more empathetic space to, to critically engage with issues of race. So, so, you know, in addition, obviously, to tracking the amazing writing and theater um, and poetry that's coming out um, from the new Irish writers, uh, you know, I, I, I think that there's, there is a way that Irish culture and writing as a category can speak to larger issues of diversity in that way. But I also think it requires thinking about as, you know, a variety of different issues, you know, again, sort of uh, the representation of uh, childhood sexual abuse or institutional abuse in Ireland, right, can, can come back to students and help them to understand, okay, this is something that seems very particular to Ireland, but in fact, these same systemic violences occur globally. So how can Ireland help us to understand the similarities and differences and how can Irish literature's representation of those systemic violences help us to critique what's going on in the world around us? Uh, uh, Marjorie, Eric, uh, in, a, in a minute or two, Claire, sorry to to cut your hand, uh, Marjorie. And, and yeah, I just want to you know, point out, you know, Claire uh, Page is in Irish Studies program in the Holy Cross, Marjorie in, uh, in Boston College, and Eric in, uh, in, uh, in Berkeley. So there's a sort of an institutional position here as well. Marjorie, do you want to give us a sense of like, uh, sort of, you know, what, what you see the future is here? Um, well, I think, I do think that going forward um, in a lot of ways, area studies generally, and that includes Irish studies are shifting and they are becoming um, more ways to address global um, issues, literatures, problems on a kind of practical level or an institutional level. One thing that um, has meant for, at least for the program that I work in is that we're trying to do more with say other area studies programs or with the international studies people. Um, last night, I because I was preparing for this, I missed a, um, an event that was jointly organized by the Irish studies program and the African and African and diaspora studies program at BC. So I think collaborative work going forward with other institutional actors who are interested in other things um, is anyway, I, I think it's a very positive development and I do think it's um, gonna make uh, for an interesting future for Irish studies. Yeah, uh, Eric, 
Um, yes, I agree with everything that Paige and Marjorie have said. And I'll just add that one other dimension of this kind of extension is, um, I think Irish, just speaking you know, from here, and I think other Irish studies programs are thinking about Irish studies beyond um, it's, it's typical core in history, literature, and cultural production, um, while also realizing that that, is, that remains the core. But, you know, what does it mean to think about Irish studies when we're talking to, uh, you, know, you know, computer scientists and, and, and you know, ec economists and things like that? I mean, and so, like, one of the things um, my colleague, Catherine Flynn, who's, current, who, who's the director of Irish studies at Berkeley now, um, she's teaching this kind of fabulously sound, this great course next semester called A Irish, which is a, in collaboration with computer science, and it's really, it's a, it's a kind of a, a survey of Irish drama from the last several centuries that also has a kind of um, art artificial intelligence component because it's going to think about questions about, it's going to do very varieties of stylistic analysis, historical stylistic analysis through, through various kinds of a AI, right? It's going to kind of have AI produced scenes um, based on, um, you know, large numbers of, of, of actual text, you know, what is there, you know, what would it look like if, um, if, you know, a, an, an AI, AI tried to produce or write um, a, 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 a stylistically typical early 20th century Irish play and, and not, not that, and, and then like, like how funny and how, how, what would it look to perform that? So she's, she's designed this kind of remarkable class um, that's happening next semester and that's happening you know, that's being kind of worked with folks from um, other parts of campus in data scientists and computer scientists. So I think that's another dimension is to think yeah. about it outside of the, the, the core humanity social sciences. Yeah, that just makes us feel inadequate. Uh, that sounds like an extraordinary course. Um, yeah, no I'm going to wrap, wrap up here. I'll, I'll come back and sort of say thanks in a few minutes, but I want to uh, hand over to Ambassador Mulhall, who was very generously offered um, to give us a, a sort of a response to the conversation we've had today. Um, so we just let me say very briefly to Claire, to Marjorie, to Paige and to Eric, and this has been such a pleasure. I've been sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, pinned to this. I had to be, but pinned to this conversation, been amazing answers. So, um, but we'll, I'll come back and, and thank you properly in a few minutes. So, but I wanna hand over to Ambassador Mulhall. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, rejoining us, Ambassador. Well, of course, uh, it's been a great um, a learning experience for me as well to, to listen to the conversation. I'm very glad that I um, have a chance to do so. Just to say that um, the conversation for me has highlighted the fact that this is a massive achievement by the editors uh, and the contributors because you have brought the whole thing together, the whole story of Irish literature going back uh, more than 300 years. Um, and that's a huge resource uh, for the future, which uh, for which you deserve great credit. And of course, what it does is it, uh, it shines a light on, on aspects of our literary uh, heritage that may have been neglected in the past. And it's good to see them now uh, brought to light again in this way. The second thing I would say um, in response to the question of, uh, is there any more in Irish literature per se? Is there, a, um, is there any future for the notion of an Irish literature? I would say I, I, my answer would be yes. And secondly, I hope so. Because um, I say yes, and I hope so because I believe that our literature is one of the guardrails of nationality and one of the reasons why we've been able to um, uh, be comfortable with the whole um, uh, globalization moment over the last uh, few decades is because we have strong guardrails to hold on to and we don't feel ourselves swept away in our identity submerged uh, in a kind of a global mess. Um, the third point I want to make is about diversity and, and you know um, uh, last year at our Heads of Mission conference in Dublin, uh, the annual one, uh, we um, we had a uh, we had a session on on how does the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, propose to reflect the diversity of Ireland with the um, seventy percent of our population um, born outside the state and you know it was a pretty important uh, discussion and we we you know we recognised the challenge we have there but at that evening I remember we we had two uh, musical performances as part of our a cultural event that we that we organised to, to for us to meet the, the various cultural organisations and we had a, a, a Irish traditional group playing a, a modern group but traditional musicians and then we had a rap group uh, from Limerick uh, made up of of people from African backgrounds who had either been born or at least grown up in Limerick so that was a kind of an eye opener for me and we do need to reflect ourselves. Uh, we look in the mirror and we need to see, you know, the more diverse Ireland in our literature, which I think we're beginning to do. Um, the third point I'd make is that as part of that, um, you know, the Irish Times uh, published a few months ago a very interesting um, uh, supplement uh, on Saturday, um, edited by Emma Dabiri, called um, uh, Black Irish Lives. And, and it really got, a, got an enormously 
positive response from people all over the country because we, you know, we have developed a, a genuine tolerance and openness to diversity in Ireland. Um, next point I would make is that, um, you know, my experience has been that our literature does really uh, enlarge Ireland's footprint uh, in the world, which is a positive thing from a diplomat's point of view because the, um, the natural condition of a small country like ours with 5 million people is to be ignored, to be neglected, to be overlooked. And our literature helps us to, to make a bit of a mark in the world uh, beyond what would be normal for a country of our size. I remember a few years ago when I was ambassador in Malaysia and also to Vietnam, I was passing through the airport in Ho Chi Minh City and I went into the bookshop. Uh, no, it's an airport bookshop, so it has kind of popular literature mainly and so forth and travel books. And But I, I, I think I counted eight Irish authors who were represented in that uh, you know, selection in that bookshop in um, you know at the airport and it wasn't Yates and Joyce and and Beckett and, and Singh it was um, you know it was uh, more more uh, more more popular writers like Patricia Scanlon and 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 and, and, um, and 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 so forth but it, but it did illustrate to me that 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 our literature not just the canonical uh, part of it but our popular literature as well does help to make Ireland better known in the wider world um uh, I was also interested in the discussion of the extent to which our our contemporary literature and our future literary evolution will be embedded in a tradition, and I think this book is an important kind of um, uh, groundwork, piece of groundwork for people, for those who are who are part of the the, the evolving tradition of Irish literature, uh, for them to 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 seek to anchor themselves. And I, and I do believe that 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 tradition will continue to be important uh, to our writers. I, I know um, a few writers in Ireland who with um, you know, different backgrounds who, who, who do appreciate, who are writing, um, you know, from their own experiences as, as immigrants in Ireland, but who do, I think, relate somehow uh, to the canon of Irish literature in a positive way. Um, there's also the question of, of whether Irish literature in the 21st century can achieve the kind of extraordinary prominence it achieved in the uh, 20th century with our four um, uh, Nobel Prize laureates. I remember a number of years ago, I, I, I wrote this um, uh, a piece, in fact, 20 years ago now, um, as an Irishman's diary in the Irish Times on the anniversary, the 80th anniversary of Yeats's Nobel Prize. And I asked the question, you know, what is it in the 21st century that's going to uh, generate the kind of um, oomph that will allow Irish literature to achieve that prominence? And I just, I, I wonder about that. And it's a question I, I often ask myself. And then finally, uh, a few months ago, I, I um, tweeted some lines from Yeats's The Second Coming. We got an extraordinary response. And people out there um, in, the Twitter world, I suppose, um, you know, a lot of them came back and, and were very positively um, taken. Um, you know, they were they were kind of moved by this poem. And, you know, it's not actually a consoling poem at all. It's, if you read it, it's kind of a dark poem. It sort of suggests the future mightn't be as, it mightn't be all that much to, to look forward to. But somehow, even though it's not a consoling poem, the very fact that Yeats sort of framed the challenges of his time in this powerful way, which was beautiful and, and, and potent language and images, meant that people, even though they weren't consoled by it, were consoled by the fact that the poem was there. And that I think is a kind of a lesson, if you like, for, for writers in general as to how they relate to the, uh, to the public world. But that's been a fascinating conversation and I just, uh, I really, really enjoyed every moment of it. And I again come back to congratulate um, um, the uh, American Conference on Irish Studies for the work they've done and all of the contributors for bringing this wonderful publication into being in this way. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ambassador Mulhall. I, I should uh, maybe give a shout out to you because later today, Ambassador Mulhall at, um, is it seven o'clock Irish time, I think? Two o'clock Irish time, two o'clock here, yeah. Yeah, we'll be taking part in a celebration for the 100th anniversary of uh, the second com coming published this week. And I love the idea of it both being, in a sense, a consolation that it's there, but it's a poem that asks us to work really hard. Um, that that is, that is like much of Yeats's late poetry that get, that gives nothing away, and that's what Claire Connolly was talking about later earlier about you know some of the why it is that indeed we still turn to literature is that it asks us to do difficult work um, uh, and asks us to think in in unusual and idiosyncratic ways. Um, it is there's nothing left here for me to do except for me to thank everybody um, who's been involved uh, today, Claire, Marjorie. Paige, Herman, Kate, Ambassador Mulhall, um, Eric, and, and, and to thank uh, um, the people who run this show, Candace and Herman, who, who make this possible for us to actually be here and be talking to you across the world. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, these are amazing volumes and um, 
and we will be talking about them, we'll be reading them, and we'll be quoting them and thinking about them for years to come. That's what these kind of volumes are. Uh, and, and I really look forward to spending more time with them. I have to admit that I haven't read them all yet. Um, uh, they're just too long. So uh, on that note, I'll say goodbye from here in Washington, DC, and from us at uh, Georgetown Global Irish Studies, and from our partners at the Embassy, the American Conference for Irish Studies, the English Department in Georgetown, and the Humanities Initiative. It's been a pleasure to be with you this morning into this afternoon, and uh, I look forward to the next event on December 3rd um, uh, in this series of the Ambassador's Hour. And finally, again, thank you to the Ambassador for giving us an hour and a quarter uh, to talk about Irish studies and Irish literature in the US and, and Ireland and across the world today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Islam is